This podcast is brought to you by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine for those that love to make and drink great beer. Learn more online or subscribe at beerandbrewing.com or find us on social media at Craft Beer Brew. Welcome to the Craft Beer and Brewing Podcast. I am your host, co-founder and editorial director of Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine, Jamie Bogner. My guest on the podcast this week has had an interesting week for himself. Lee Claghorn from Outer Range Brewery. Uh, you know, I, I, uh, I reached out to Lee and then uh, shortly after that, uh, maybe an hour later, they post up on uh, social media that uh, they're doing a major recall on a whole bunch of canned beers and uh, dumping a whole bunch of tanks of beer thanks to a cross-contamination with some Saison uh, yeast that contained diastaticus, which is, uh, of course, a normal thing for some of their beers and not a normal thing for their IPAs. It's been a tough week. Lee, welcome to the podcast. I know uh, you're, you're uh, you know short on sleep and uh, have been brewing like a madman after cleaning like a madman this week. How, uh, how are things going? Uh, they're going great. Uh, <laughs> thanks so much for coming up the hill and, and talking to us. And uh, like, like you said, you know, I, I know you reached out to me right before we did the social media post, so didn't intend it for this conversation to be all about diastaticus, and, and so I just appreciate you coming up and, and, and talking to us about our beer. Well, it's a timely conversation. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about your approach to uh, you know progressive IPAs and uh, your approach to saisons, where that diastaticus-based uh, saison yeast is an appropriate uh, expression. But before we get started, uh, as the brewing industry's premier choice for glycol chilling, G&D Chillers has set the standard on quality, service, and dedication to their customers' craft. G&D is committed to cold, whether you operate a brew pub or large-scale production brewery. Contact G&D Chillers today at 1-800-555-0973 or reach out online at gdchillers.com. Mention this podcast and receive up to $1,000 worth of glycol with the purchase of any new G&D Chiller. And... Turn your fridge into the best craft beer bar around with the Tavor app. Get access to hard to find 100% independent craft beer from 47 states. Only buy the beers you want and skip the ones you don't. Ship any amount of your hand picked beer to your doorstep for one flat fee. Yep, any amount. Download the free Tavor app today and get $10 in beer money with code BREWING. All right, Lee, let's talk about uh, out of range now. Um, you know, before we uh, get into the uh, deeper conversation, uh, you know, when uh, I've talked to you in the past, and we wrote a breakout brewer story uh, for Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine on you uh, last year, um, you talked about a, a really pivotal moment when you decided you wanted to, uh, you know, to start this brewery. Your ha- history and past and your, your uh, pathway to brewing is a little different than a lot of the kind of engineer and technical folks that, uh, that we tend to talk to. Tell me a little bit about uh, how you and your wife, Emily, co-founder of the brewery, um, you know, got into brewing and, uh, and what led you to this point, uh, to, to launch a commercial craft brewery? Absolutely. Um, so I went to high school, I had the, the privilege of going to high school in Brussels. So I was 16 years old, drinking a Chimay Blue, uh, down in downtown Brussels. And that kind of opened my eyes to the wonderful world of beer, um, which is pretty easy with that beer. And, uh, spent the rest of high school there and went back and forth during college. And, uh, you know, just really fell in love with those beers. And when I went to went to college at Boston U, a couple of friends and I uh, started home brewing like crazy. And uh, you know, couldn't just drink the the natty light that everybody is drinking in college. So um, got into it pretty early. And and uh, I went to went to school on a ROTC scholarship and signed my contract uh, right before 9/11, like a week before. So got in there and then the conditions changed quite a bit um and then you know iraq and afghanistan were going so i participated in both of those and whenever i wasn't doing that um you know i'd come back home and brew beer with a bunch of bunch of friends in the backyard and probably brewed uh, i don't know 300 to 400 different beers just as a home brewer um you know while i was in the military so i did it quite a bit and always knew that um wanted to come out eventually and start a brewery and just kind of get getting wrapped up in everything that was going on overseas and and one day I was in Afghanistan and looked up and said man I got to get out of this now or I'm not going to get out of it so uh, my wife and I actually met in Colorado at my apartment at a homebrew party Uh, a couple friends brought her over and um, Emily and I clicked right away and got engaged three months later and 
Uh, got married about a year and a half after that, but beer has always been part of our story, and uh, we always wanted to start the brewery together, and and so we finally did it. Uh, left that military world. She was in as well, um, intel officer, and uh, came back to Colorado after the army had kicked us around a bit, and decided to to put the brewery where we, you know, spent all our weekends when we were living out here up in Summit County, up at nine thousand feet, right by six amazing ski resorts, and uh, it's been great. We've been open two and a half years, uh, focusing on IPAs and Belgians. Um, we've had a great time. We've got a great team. And we're very fortunate for, you know, all of the all the success that we've had, and and very appreciative of, uh, you know, all of our fans. We're sitting out on your uh, patio to escape the brewery noise inside, and uh, so there's some some environmental stuff. But it is a, a beautiful scene here, surrounded by mountains, uh, up here in uh, Frisco, Colorado. Uh, tell me a little bit. You know, now your pathway to get here from military was actually I, I thought an interesting one where uh, you know some folks jump right into the business you all actually uh, did some grad school turns in order to build uh, you know a skill set that you thought you needed then to get into this business side we did yeah we went to we went to grad school um, and same time as that I studied uh, entrepreneurship essentially and uh, learned all, all the things about running a business that I didn't know from being in the military. I think had a strong background in leadership, but obviously not uh, anything beyond that related to financials or marketing or anything. And Emily focused on marketing. Um, and then I went to the American Brewers Guild during that time as well and uh, interned at a brewery and then... then in, interned ended, at a, a little brewery up there. Yeah, right? a small brewery. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then ended up... Other half here. brewing in, in Brooklyn, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Which is a great opportunity. Sure, um, sure. It was a fun time. It was really before all the chaos started with where they went. Um, those guys have been, you know, amazing. Right, right. Um, so, and here we are today. So, so what made you st- uh, focus on uh, IPAs and then, uh, of course, uh, Belgian and Saison styles? Um, you know, my, my first love is Belgians and Saisons. And, yeah. and so that was an obvious thing. And actually, we really weren't going to brew IPAs and... Um, you know, I almost didn't drink IPAs for probably 10 years when I kind of went through that amber IPA phase um, or period before it came to what IPAs are now and just drinking all the IPAs on the East Coast. Uh, they were so amazing. Um, you know, 20, 2013, 2014 time frame uh, really changed every everything about how I perce- perceive those beers and what they could be. And, and we were going to come out here and only do Belgians. And uh, we just saw an opportunity for IPAs. And so we we uh, made that switch. It was kind of unintentional. Our first batch ever that we brewed here was a farmhouse that's actually on tap right now. Um, and we thought we'd do, you know, a good mix, but it's turned out to be 95% IPAs. We just can't keep the tanks full of IPAs. So, so your love of Saison uh, this week has, uh, you know, led you to a, an interesting kind of challenge. Let's uh, let's talk about that before we, uh, you know, shift later on into to talking about uh, creative and fun things around IPAs. Um, you know, but uh, one of the, the Saison uh, uh, strains that you use is the diastaticus strain, which, you know, in and of itself is not a bad thing. It's a great thing. The strains, uh, you know, uh, attenuate in a crazy high level and leave you really nice dry beers. Um, you know, but when that yeast hops into, uh, you know, your, uh, say London ale three or, uh, you know, other kind of, uh, hazy IPA, uh, yeast, uh, pitches, it's uh, not such a great thing. Um, tell me a little bit about, uh, how that happened, you know, what you've been able to, you know, uh, as you've reverse engineered how, uh, you know, this happened, um, you know, uh, what have you been able to figure out as to, to what was the cause of this and, uh, and how it's kind of affected everything? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, diastaticus is a beautiful thing. It's like that friend that uh, has always been good to you, but you know every once in a while, every few years, they have some social blow-up that just kind of nukes everything you know. Um, but you still go back to them because they're so, they're so great to be around. So that's how I feel about diastaticus. But, uh, yeah, we use a lot of it in the brewery. Uh, we do a lot of saisons, and we always know that it's a, a threat. Um, and um, there's a lot of it in our brewery. You know, we've been brewing for uh, over two and a half years now, and there's there's a lot of diastaticus around. So what what happened as quickly as I can uh, throw it down, we we uh, release cans every weekend, and you know, summertime there's a lot of beer moving. It moves fast, and we're brewing. Uh, we we brew um, right around three thousand barrels right now. We're at capacity. Our brewery's real small. Twenty four hundred square feet is everything. Cold room, cellar, tap room. Uh, brew house so we're packed in there um, 
And so we released the beer this past weekend um, on July 4th. Actually, we released it, I guess, it was a Thursday. We canned it Thursday morning on July 4th. We canned it and put it out. And by Sunday night, we started getting some texts from, not texts, but messages from some of our uh, most loyal customers who, you know, we talk to all the time. And they said, hey, you know, this batch, we brewed one of our favorite beers in the deep steep with Double Dry Hop Nelson. And this beer is amazing. It's one of my favorite beers. And yeah. um, we hadn't done it uh, in that format yet. And it's also... You know, we don't do it all the time. It's the most expensive beer we make. So we don't do it all the time for that reason, but we also like to keep it special. Um, and so we got, you know, thankfully a couple of our people reached out to us. Our customers reached out and told us, hey, this beer, you know, doesn't taste like it usually does. It doesn't taste like your beer. So um, that was late Sunday night. Monday morning we came in here and, and tasted the beers. And sure enough, we're, everybody on the production team came together and we noticed immediately that, it, you know, it exhibited characteristics of diastaticus so obviously that's not a great thing so what we did was uh we tried to you know we had some beers that were warming up we left warm you know for you know quality uh control purposes and previously packaged beers previously packaged beers and then we're you know when we tasted the beer on packaging all the weekend tasted phenomenal and then diastaticus turned the beer pretty quickly actually and uh so we just sent every um we sent every um, sample we had of every beer in a can, in the fermenter, in a bright tank, down to Firmly, which does lab work for small breweries like ours. And uh, we stopped selling the beer immediately. Uh, we didn't want to put out information before we knew exactly what it was. We thought it was diastaticus, but I didn't want to put out that it was diastaticus until we knew it was diastaticus. So they came back uh, Tuesday night, Wednesday morning uh, with all the lab results. And uh, we, we put out a post on social media, everywhere on social media, and I told the whole thing about what happened. Um, you know, the thing about bad news is it doesn't get better with time. So we just uh, told the whole story uh, from front end to, or from the beginning to the end of, you know, how we think it came to be in the brewery, which, you know, in the released beers on, on draft, and then we were dumping all those beers and immediately offered refunds to all of our customers who, um, who asked who would want a refund so you know we were really humbled because the response was actually incredibly positive from from uh, our customers yeah. we, and i can't tell you you know how humbling that was uh because we you know we take such great pride as every brewer does every every beer you put out there you just have everything behind you think about the recipes for so long you know, there's so much hard work and all the production staff and, you know, the bartenders and people on the canning line to put these things out. And so you really care about that product. And um, when, you know, the brewer's worst nightmare, but it keeps people awake at night is, you know, if something bad is happening in the tank or a customer has your beer and has a bad experience. And, you know, when that happens, it's, you know, it's the whole world turns upside down as a brewer. You know, you really care about the, at the end of the day, all you care about is giving your, your customers a great experience. You know, I like to think that, you know, our customers, uh, we have transactions with them, but we don't have a transactional relationship. We, that's not what this is about. We have a, we've got like a social contract. We have a trust relationship. They come in here, sacrifice their time and their money for our beer. And, you know, we love them and they love our beer. And our whole job is to make sure that they have a great experience because, you know, people's lives are pretty short and they've got scarce resources and they walk through the door to spend money on our beer that's a humbling experience for sure now it, you know it can be hard from a you know a technical standpoint to explain what something like diastatic is which is really just a diastatic strain of a saison yeast and that kind of cross contamination can mean um you know how do you do that for a customer yeah we we spent a lot of time on that and that was you know we spent uh, several hours a couple people on the production staff you know thinking about it. as a brewer you kind of know what diastaticus is but if as a consumer, if you've never heard of it, you know, you, you have n no conception of what that is doing to the beer. In reality, a diastaticus is just taking those long chain sugars that shouldn't be broken down in a London L3 hazy IPA and breaking them down. And then those London L3 hazy IPAs, there's a lot of residual sugar. Sure you know, they're is. finishing at like four, five, six, maybe even seven Play-Doh, uh, which, you know, is almost where some beers can start out. And right. Diastaticus in there. There's a lot of there's a lot of food for that uh, that to eat. Um, so, and then, you know, it immediately kills the hop aroma, overcarbonates the beer, and turns it into a, kind of a weird Saison flavor. 
Um, so we, you know, put that information out there as best we could on social media, you know, tell people it's still safe, you know, it's still safe to drink. It just, right, right. you know, kills the experience. Let's talk a little bit about, uh, you know, some of your technical uh, approach to, uh, you know, number one, reverse, you know, figuring out where, uh, you know, the, the problems might happen. Before we do that, uh, balancing barley and hops is your expertise and food grade lubricants is the expertise of Clarion lubricants. The team at Clarion knows when it comes to making great beer, you're the expert. And when it comes to supplying food grade lubricants backed by service oriented professionals, they're the experts. Clarion will work with you to create an efficient lubrication program that helps protect your brewery to speak with an expert dial 1-855-MY-CLARION that's 855-692-5274 or visit clarionlubricants.com clarion lubricants the experts that experts trust so lee were you able to figure out where that kind of you know cross contamination might have happened in, in the brew house so we don't you know we don't know for sure i don't think we'll ever know exactly for sure the initial uh, contamination but we you know have a pretty good idea and so what we think happened is uh, uh, we had initial contamination in one fermenter and I'll come back to how we think that happened but then we harvested yeast from that sure. because it you know sensory it didn't exhibit any characteristics of course of the diastaticus so harvested yeast from that and put that in a lot of other fermenters. So, you know, for those that, you know, uh, may not be as familiar with this, you know, small amounts of diastaticus, you know, may not exhibit that flavor in a, as you're harvesting from a tank because it's so overpopulated with London Ale 3 or whatever yeast you might be using for your hazy IPA, but it, it is quickly able to outcompete when it's fed again. And, and so can certainly grow. And over time, you know, as that kind of expands, uh, it can outcompete that London Ale 3 and overtake it um you know so it's natural that you wouldn't have sensed it in that kind of environment but then it may have exhibited itself more seriously in future iterations exactly and you know we've been deep diving hard on diastaticus the past few days and uh you know from everything we've we've seen is you know just the very minuscule amount that is you know entirely und- undetectable sensory wise uh for a long time just over time will you know um reproduce and, and then eventually take over the beer so uh, what we think happened was that, um, and talking, I spoke to uh, Danny at Firmly, and they've been fantastic because um, the benefit of working with them is that, you know, they see these problems all the time, whereas hopefully we see it once. They've seen a bunch of these situations, and, and they said, you know, as far as introduction of diastaticus into the initial uh, fermenter, they see that a lot of times through dry hopping. You know, mm. we have tons of dry hopping in our brewery, and we have tons of diastaticus in our brewery. Sure, sure. Uh, so... We think, you know, that is probably where it initially came from. In the fermenter that uh, the diastaticus uh, originally reared its head has never had a Belgian in it. Huh. So, so know, it's not just a CIP uh, clean in place kind of pro, you know, protocol that didn't do its job. It really is uh, some other way that it happened. That's what we think. Um, and so, you know, that's inter- interesting that he said that. And you also get, he said you need a lot of candida is introduced which is a fungus that can get into beer through dry hopping but it's something that never really is visible in the end product Uh, but but the fact that we have a lot of that diastaticus in the brewery i think that's where it initially came from and then uh you know was repitched the yeast in this case london ale 3 into a bunch of other beers you know as far as the you know dialing back and looking where this can happen you know brewers talk about hot side which is everything on the brew house that is hot um, and you know, uh, contamination at that point is uh, not really an issue because everything is at pasteurization temperature. And then the cold side, which is after it goes through the heat exchanger, cools down, goes into the cellar. And when you're at that cooler temperatures of room temperature or below, then uh, then that's when you open yourself up to possibilities. And that's why you know CIP process is super important. And you know we didn't think it was coming from our heat exchanger which is often a big place in breweries for contamination we do two full cip cycles in between brews uh, just because we know that can be a problem and so and we also had knocked out other beers that use different yeast in between different uh, beers that we brewed that ended up having diastaticus in it that turned out clean that we got lab tested so We've got a stout that we lab tested for everything that we're releasing today, actually, and, and that's totally clean. And another IPA that had a fresh pitch from uh, BSI, uh, London Ale 3, that, that is totally fine. So 
so by triangulating that way and looking at uh, the beers that weren't didn't uh, carry that on you were able to identify that happened in the yeast pitch and that's what we that's what we think happened and you know statistically we can't rule out another possibility yeah Um, but uh you know we just sit here and and spend all our time at night laying awake pondering where it came from and that's what we think so far tell me a little bit about the uh the the cleanup process you know now trying to make sure that all of those uh tanks and then all the other gear and then the general brew house i mean you have to be then you know looking forward to how you uh, uh institute new practices if it's in the air uh and just in your general environment uh, how does that affect uh, the way that you now dry hop in the future? But first, like you know, what, tell me about that that cleanup process of uh, of trying to uh, make sure that anything that touched that uh, isn't going to do the same thing in the future. Yeah, exactly. So uh, but the first thing we did actually was call our local uh, water treatment plant because okay. we're in a small town and told them we're going to dump three thousand gallons yeah, of beer down yeah. the drain because that's pretty significant three thousand gallons and actually it ended up being a little bit more than that it's probably oh, about geez. four thousand uh oh. down the drain so but we gave them the heads up they've it's been 100 plus barrels of beer off of a small brewery that's uh that's no small uh amount of work it is it is not it is not small <laughs> for us anyway um but you know the good thing is that we were able to identify it in lab testing so we lost probably forty thousand dollars of ingredients and our lost revenue could have been well north of a hundred thousand dollars but we were able to identify the loss pretty early with or the the contamination pretty early with firmly and getting feedback from our customers which was great and so we were able to dump those tanks and do our cleaning process and uh, guys from proximity malt drove a pallet of malt up here in the back of a pickup truck just so we could get things going on time and uh refilling everything now we've been brewing for 48 hours straight pretty much but uh, for the cleaning process you know we are you know doing massive uh, full cip uh, on everything uh, you know two or three times Uh, we're looking at every gasket if there's you know we're replacing every gasket we've ordered um, all new hoses for the brewery and our hoses were already pretty new but just as a possibility we looked at one so we did look at one of the hoses that we were using for repitching we inspected all the hoses and there was a cut in one of the hoses we were using to repitch the yeast so we think that might have been a possibility but we think it's right around that system um of course we can't prove that but uh that's what we think and so um you know we did uh, a couple down days and broke apart the whole brewery which you know is a good thing to do anyway um and you know going forward we are testing every beer before it's packaged and we'll keep doing that um does it change the way you do like general uh you know cleaning of the brewery and have you thought about uh, new standard operating procedures around uh you know just that you know trying to knock down however much might be floating around in the air um we have and you know chemical suppliers we use a lot of loffler they've been fantastic about you know look, uh, looking at uh, you know foaming cleansers you can spray all over the brewery and, and try to kill everything um, we have looked you know we've got a, a lot of a lot of our brewer friends have uh, you know texted me and talked about their experiences because once you know, once you come out with this every brewer is like oh yeah that <laughs> happened to us a year ago and you're like, oh yeah I remember that um, and uh, well one of the things we're doing is uh, just doing a uh, in addition to our CIP procedures, we are doing a, a hot uh, rinse at 180 degrees uh, for several minutes because in the thought process behind that um, is that if there is a surface that is somehow tucked away behind something that the chemicals can't get to, the, the radiant heat will pasteurize that specific part of you know uh, a hose or a fermenter or whatever yeah. it is. So in addition to kind of chemical CIP, you're also using heat in addition to that? Yes. How will that uh, change some of your materials handling? You know, obviously you mentioned if it's popping in through dry hopping, uh, you know, are you uh, growing more concerned about how you treat those hops or what that process looks like? Yeah, actually one of the things we had been looking at purchasing, um, it might be a little delayed now since we just, you know, dumped all that down the drain, (laughs) 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 was a... uh, was uh, essentially hop cannon just to make yeah. things easier uh, to get the hops into the tank without our guys having to get up on ladders and and uh, you know be a little bit. Our reasoning was it would be easier for our staff and a, and a little bit safer, um, but now 
we look at it also from a sanitation perspective that you're eliminating, uh, you know, the ambient, at least in our brewery, the, the ceilings are so low and we've got all these rafters and, you know, you've got, uh, you know, almost three years of yeast that is everywhere in the brewery. And those rafters are, you know, just a nightmare when you think about what yeast is ambient yeast has floated up there. And, and so that would, you know, and we're dry hopping, we're pretty close to that, uh, environment. And so, you know, a little harder to sanitize those uh, wooden rafters in the, in the ceiling <laughs> of the brewery. <laughs> it is. It is. Um, so that, that's uh, one thing that we're looking at uh, in the near future. And, you know, that's also to say we realize that it, it might not have been from the dry hopping. You know, yeah. we, we don't know. So, and that's where you, that's where you get to be as a brewer once, once you get diastaticus into other yeast. <laughs> <laughs> Start second guessing everything. Are there any other, uh, you know, processes or technical side that you've, uh, you know, that this has, uh, you know, caused you to look at? Yeah. Um, well, we looked at, uh, you know, talking, you know, talking with the firmly guys. We, you know, once, you know, obviously once that it's in the in the fermenter, you, know, you look at where is it first. You just look at where it first came in into contact with the beer and or the wort, and uh, it's everywhere beyond that. And so, um, you know, we're looking at. You know, I talked to the guys at Firmly about where exactly you know we get our you know, most likely situation for, for catching this, and uh, they had said in their experience, you know, canning lines don't really, you don't really pick up anything in a canning line for the most part. Um, and and uh, Danny from Firmly asked me, he said, what what canning line do you have? So I got a Cody. He said that's that's great because we can hit it with 180 degree caustic, um, so that is really beneficial but that's you know nice to know reach out to other industry folks and see exactly where the likely points are and uh you know most likely it is uh you know dry hopping in the process cip process so um just tightening those things up uh we are you know i think the biggest thing for us is you know as a small brewery you talk about quality assurance versus quality control and quality assurance is you know your processes um it's you know how you're cleaning things and and you know we've gone, you know, almost three years with with nothing happening essentially, and and then this happens. So you're like, well, what have we been changing? And we have changed some things recently. So in the past, you know, six to eight months, we're looking at maybe going back to the original way we we have been doing those. But uh, brewery our size with our limited space, our capacity to really have quality control, which is just on the you know, the product side is really controlling what products you're putting out there through lab testing, you know, so far has really been limited to, you know, sensory things, you know, we're using, uh, you know, some, uh, fast orange to try to identify, you know, things that are going to sour a beer. Um, but having the capability to reach out, you know, to, uh, to a full lab and full lab service, uh, through, you know, company, there are lots of them that are out there, but we're going to use firmly in Denver. Um, is fantastic. That's a great, uh, gives us great peace of mind that every single beer we're going to put out is that, you know, gone through a full lab uh, process. Yeah. So 4,000 gallons of beer or thereabouts, um, you know, represents a pretty, you know, significant, what, you know, four per five percent of a yearly production for a brewery that's, uh, you know, brewing about 3,000 barrels a year. Um, that's you know almost what two weeks of, of production in the middle of a you know prime summer beer season. Uh, talk to me a little bit about you know some of the challenges just from a business standpoint of making sure you have beer to sell, and uh, you know and catching back up to speed uh, with uh, you know production and what you know your various accounts as well as your tap room expect from that. Yeah, absolutely. First, I'll say I got a great insurance guy. He came by the day after. I, I just want to notify him we've got this issue. He, <laughs> he was in the brewery and some guy texted me and said, "Hey, there's a guy, Todd." here i said i don't know who todd is because i didn't expect him to come at all but my insurance guy todd board has been amazing um and so that was you know gave us some peace of mind that he's been you know just all over us to get information and ask how he can help at all and um you know so are you insured for this kind of thing i am insured for product loss oh but you know for us it's also you know when you make an insurance claim you're you're uh uh, costs for the insurance are going to go up. So we're waiting to see really how much yeah, of the hit yeah. hit we can take and then make a educated decision about how much we want to claim if we want to claim and, and that, but yeah, it's peak season. We're at, you know, pretty much dumped almost all of our beer and, uh, that's obviously problematic. 
Uh, but you know, we're that's we're, putting it lightly. <laughs> <laughs> that's putting it lightly. You know, I've dealt with bigger issues in my life, so this is okay. We can manage this. The biggest thing is that you know, this problem didn't harm anyone, didn't harm customers. Um, we got in front of it really quickly, and so you know, the cost of dumping that much beer. You know, probably forty thousand dollars in cost and a lot of lost revenue. But at the end of the day, uh, the most important thing is maintaining a trust relationship with our customers. And so, transactionally, might be difficult in the near term, but long term um, is really what we're looking at. So, um, but one of the things that has been amazing, lots of brewers have reached out. We've got uh, a bunch of brewers reached out to see if we needed beer. So I've got on, really? on tap. I've got I've got uh, cerebral. Sean sent me a bunch of beer. Uh, Troy Casey's sending us some beer, and we're going to pour some of that. Uh, we, we just don't know how much beer we're going to go through in the next, you know, really next seven days till our, ne- our first batch is going to come out. And so the, that's been amazing. The, you know, the assistance from uh, friends out there in the industry has been great. That sounds awesome. And despite what people, you know, a lot of rumors out there that Sean sent us a diastaticus glitter bomb from Cerebral, <laughs> but that you know, that is not the case. I just want to put those rumors to rest right now. I wouldn't put it past for uh, <laughs> Troy to uh, you know, sabotage you in some way, right? <laughs> <That's> right. <laughs> After he steals all your secrets. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, let's let's pivot a little bit and and, and talk about uh, more fun and creative things, and uh, and talk a little bit about some of your approach uh, uh, to designing uh, hazy and soft and yeast forward uh, IPAs. Um, you mentioned being inspired by some of you know these East Coast uh, IPAs in the 2013 2014 you know time frame. How uh, talk to me a little bit about how you've taken some of that inspiration. Um, and formulated beers that taste like outer range, you know, because you do make, you know, beers in a similar style. Um, but having said that, your beers have a particular character that becomes your character that, uh, and then they, you know, that carries across some of these beers. How do you develop and how have you developed a unique approach that tastes like outer range to these styles of beer? Yeah. So, I mean, uh, we, we look at it from, I think a couple things actually we take from Belgian beers. We try to have a ester profile in our uh, New England IPAs. And we think that, uh, you know, different ways of trying to force that and selecting yeast that, that um, you know, produce uh, more esters than others um, has been great. We played around when we first started, we played around a bunch of different yeasts and kind of looked for that quality and finally, you know, found one from a different uh you know, from a supplier that we liked. And we use a bunch of different yeast. We use London L3, we use Conan, um, um, and we just kind of play around with how we can get each one to make each beer into our style. And, you know, every strain from every yeast provider is actually different. And, you know, brewers talk about this all the time, you know, Conan from one yeast provider is really totally different than another. So you've got to go through that and figure out which ones you like and then start selecting from there. Um, and then, you know, one, one thing that we've uh, done in the past two years is uh, we've, put a lot of, we've put a lot of New England IPs out there with some uh, old world hops and the dry hop. It's not kind of an herbal uh, kick to them. And uh, sometimes we, we, uh, we've run with that quite a bit as far as proportion, but most of the time it's not, not too much. No, you know, just uh, probably 5 to 10% of the dry hopping uh, will give that. You don't want to really go more than that. But... That's an interesting point that was on my list of things to talk to you about. Uh, some of, and we're, we're in a lucky position down in Fort Collins. We're about two hours away from you, um, you know. But you have, uh, you know, your trucks come down and deliver to the Tap and Handle bar right next to us, and uh, and oftentimes you'll pop next door and uh, drop off a couple of cans so we can try the new stuff that you release. Um, it's truly a gift. Thank you all for uh, for your support of us and sharing your beer with us. We appreciate it. Um, you know, but as a result, we've gotten to try a lot of a lot of the beers that you make, and uh, you know, I was really drawn to to one, and I can't remember. It started with a B, um, but it was. You know, was dry hopped in part with noble hops, and I thought it was such a fascinating approach to use these hops with such a familiar flavor that almost created that kind of touchstone for for hops that I'm familiar with, but within other beers, and they worked really intriguingly well in the scope of this kind of New England style IPA. Um, talk to me a little bit about how you uh, you know approach that kind of blend of old school and new, new school hops. 
Yeah, I mean, that idea came really from looking at the esters and, you know, loving the, you know, the characteristics of, of the hazy IPA that were being thrown that weren't necessarily from Citra Mosaic Galaxy Nelson. And, uh, I mean, those are phenomenal. And, of course, you know, best beers out there. But uh, I really loved kind of it started to taste this uh, almost herbal note just from the yeast. And, and so thought about trying to accentuate that a little bit. And, you know, some noble hops work well and some don't. We haven't done one with saws, and I'm not going to do one with saws. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but you know, Golding um, has been uh, really great to use. Hallertau, straight up German Hallertau, middle fruit in very small quantities. We've liked. Um, what kind of quantities? You say very small. What's very small? Very small. I mean, we usually are. You know, we're putting. You know, like everybody between six to you know eleven barrels or pounds of hops in, in a barrel of the IPA and we're not going to put more than, you know, 10% of noble hops in there. Okay. And, you know, I, we haven't pushed it, so maybe it'll work, but I just, I don't want to put out a, 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 you know, a smash Hallertau middle fruit double dry hop beer. I don't think it's going to work. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, what you say about, it, I mean, Citra Mosaic, Citra Galaxy, those are obviously standard cl- now. Cl- I mean, you say classic, it's like, what, it's been classic for three or four years now. <laughs> it's so strange that we, you know, can refer to, you know, with craft beer moving as fast as it is. Um, that now seems, you know, like a classic kind of thing. Um, you know, but how much drive for diversity do you see among your customers? You know, I think, I know that's something that the brewers want to explore that, uh, you know, doing the same thing over and over and over again isn't as interesting to you from a creative perspective. But not only that, you know, consumers are always looking for something new and interesting. Um, how do they respond to those kinds of things? Because then there's also, you know, those certain characters like, you know, for example, Sabro, um, where there are a number of customers that may not like the character that that adds to a beer. Um, how do you balance that kind of you know, need for innovation and in creating new experiences for, you know, for your customers with you know, that kind of standard and uh, need for consistency so that you know, your customer is generally going to like what you do? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, we've, we uh, have brewed over 200 different recipes and no matter what, when we put in the steep up on the draft, it usually moves fastest. And that's Citra? That's all Citra. Um, it was like the fourth beer we brewed or something like that. And we didn't want to have a flagship, but it just kind of became that. So we have it around most of the time. Um, I mean, it's one of my favorites, <laughs> as you know. So Sorry. It's, a, it's also <laughs> an expensive beer to make. So they were like, man, our flagship is like one of the most expensive IPAs. It doesn't really make sense. But I guess it does because people can taste it you know people can taste the quality in the malt and uh and the hops and so that's how that comes about but for you know for the how do you get customers to or how what is their relationship like with the experimentation um in their selection of a product you know it's very high they all love drinking new beers i mean these we're just like our customers you know i've got friends that ship me beer you know from all over the place and i'm so excited to try it and drink new beers and our customers the exact same way and uh so i don't think there's any difference in opinion between you know how we look at it and how our customers look at it you know we are not marketing to people who really aren't diehard craft beer people we don't make those beers we make beers for people that are uh, you know have palates uh, like ours that really like intense flavors uh still like well-balanced beer and we do that with some of the belgians but uh you know, for the most part, we, we see just an increasing thirst for, for new beers uh, from customers, even though they'll come back to, you know, in the steep, in the deep steep, or, you know, when we don't make a beer for a while, I hear about it. I'll be in the tap room and customers say, hey, you got to make this beer again. I'm like, okay, and I'll make it again if I hear it a bunch of times. So, so what is that process as you're, you know, say evaluating hops and trying to, you know, uh, create something new? What, what is, uh, what does your creative process look like in that? Uh, you know, first I'll say, you know, we're really fortunate to have some really good hop contracts. Um, we've got a couple going now, and that's been that's been a world of difference, not having to, you know, buy anything on Lupulin Exchange, uh, which is a great place to get hops. And, you know, I just 
get you know just to have the assurance of uh, where your hops came from and how they're stored is fantastic uh, you know that's everything as far as a creative process to get there um i don't know we just uh you know i really don't know i just sit and think about recipes for a while or have a beer and and uh have it with some food and have a different idea about our beer as it is and, and come up with a new a new uh, there's no systematic way it just happens and then you just brew it and then you hope it works out well we just brew it <laughs> we just brew it now I think, you make it sound so simply yeah well i think at this point you know we brewed so many beers and brewed so many batches you know we don't have we started out with a pilot system uh we started out as a 15 barrel system we had a 30 barrel uh fermenter two 15 barrel fermenters and then a one barrel pilot system with seven one barrel uh fermenters and that was terrible because (laughs) (laughs) we were just brewing all the time on for a little amount of beer uh, because we actually needed needed the volume but that was great so we could experiment a lot and i think through that initial period of just experimenting and brewing tons of beer um you know, a uh, high high frequency helped a lot in just understanding how the how our system created flavors, and uh, now we can pretty much just understand how they're going to come to be. It's sometimes it's a surprise, uh, but for the most part, we, you know, we, we come at a beer from a certain perspective, and it usually works out. You know, for the most part. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you mentioned ester profile earlier and uh, extract, getting a certain type of ester profile out of that. How would you describe that ester profile? And, uh, you know, what are some of the, you know, how, do, how you know, in terms of what temperature and pitch rates, you know, what do you, you know, tend to use in order to, to get those kinds of, that kind of ester production? Uh, we use temperature and pitch rates primarily. You know, uh, people talk about increased production of esters, you can uh, dial back oxygenation increase the temperature um or you know you're just looking to kind of stress the yeast a little bit to throw off more esters and you can do it through those different ways and there's definitely thresholds you know you can't you can't ferment conan at 90 degrees and hope for great esters it's not going to work out so every yeast and yeast strain you get from different providers is kind of different you have to mess around with that but they provide tons of information you know in recommended ranges and sometimes we push them a little bit higher than that than they recommend but uh um you know, just through dialing in those processes, uh, that's, I think that's worked for us. And, you know, it's my perception. There's a lot of ester profile in our beers and maybe other people don't think that, but you know, everybody's got a different palate and, and, uh, you know, that's fine. How do you, uh, you know, tell the difference or how can you, um, Maybe I should back up and say, uh, oftentimes the impact of esters can be also confused, especially by consumers, with the impact of those hops. Um, you know, how do you, uh, you know, taste the difference, you know, between those contributions? Well, I think, uh, you know, it's got to be said that the hops are throwing out the vast majority. Yeah. You know, the hops are just totally dominating the beers. And, uh, but, you know, you can't b- brew, a, you know, these beers with a lot of, a lot of other yeasts. So, you know, obviously we don't want like huge uh, banana characteristics, uh, you know, to, to overpower, you know, dank mosaic blueberry. So that, you know, that's not what we're looking for. Um, but, uh, you know, there, you know, I think first and foremost, it's hops. And I think the esters really just kind of p- play a background note uh, to it all, which is really nice. So what's the ester difference between something like London Ale 3 and Conan for you? Um, you know, I think they're... I think they're similar. I mean, as you're thinking about this, I can imagine you thinking like, what kind of yeast am I going to push together with these kinds of hops in order to the, for the yeast ester to complement the hops flavors? You know, how, how, do you, uh, how do you think about those things? Well, I'll say, you know, we do do more London Ale 3 than Conan. And so uh, we are just kind of familiar with uh, that more. But, you know, I could get a lot more banana off of Conan than I do London Ale 3. And maybe that's just me, you know, your threshold for, for that is pretty low. In a lot of cases, so are pretty high in a lot of cases. So, um, you know, we we like the tropical notes coming off of uh, London Ale Three, and Conan's got it too. I'll just say, you know, we're not good, we're not as good at working with Conan as we are London Ale Three. Yeah, so it just becomes kind of a practice and familiarity thing. Yeah, and we are putting out a lot more Conan beers now, just to just to dial it in. Um, and you know, we found that how we treat London Ale Three doesn't cross over one to one with how we how we should treat Conan. In what way? I think that, um, you know, we ferment London Ale 3 pretty high. I don't think we can ferment at least the Conan we're getting as high as we ferment London Ale 3. Um, what do what you typically ferment at? We're fermenting uh, around 70. Okay. You know, some beers are higher, some beers are lower, just based off of uh, what we're trying to 
achieve with a beer uh, and what that recipe calls for. But we really haven't dialed in uh, like an optimal temperature for the for the Conan that we're using, in my opinion, yet. Interesting. Um, maybe we should talk about saisons for a little while because uh, that's another subject that's uh, near and dear to your heart. You know, as you think about uh, uh, you know, designing and uh, and then brewing saisons, uh, uh, you know, what type of uh, you know flavor and goals are you envisioning with those? You know, I, it's great. I, you know, saisons are really my favorite. Um, and, you know, for the most part, you know, saisons, it's all about the yeast. And uh, that's what we've seen in our brewery the past, uh, past week anyway. You know, it's in a bad way. But it, the beautiful thing about saisons is that it's such a simple, I think the best saisons are just super simple. You know, great, right. great European uh, pills and malt, maybe a little bit of Vienna, and then uh, a great yeast selection and uh, minimal, obviously minimal hop uh, aroma and profile from that because um, uh, hops will overtake a saison pretty quickly in a maybe undesirable way. Um, and the great thing about, you know, saisons, we've done some new world hopping in saisons just to experiment it, but, I mean, nothing is better than just a, a beautiful, just a beautiful, uh, you know, classic saison recipe. And, and uh, it, you can get the really dry, crisp saisons like uh, we do with a, you know, variant of thirty-seven eleven, which you know originated uh, supposedly from Brasserie Thierrier, yeah, um, in France, which I got to go to one time. Pretty great place. <laughs> um, and uh, but then you can throw off, uh, you know, a couple other, and that'll leave a beautiful dry, effervescent beer because of the diastaticus. Uh, but you can get you know a non-diastaticus strain and still get a great mouthfeel using some wheat malt, and we'll use unmalted wheat to get uh, really raw wheat flavor in there and great mouthfeel. Um, what kind of percentages of wheat do you use in those? In those, you know, pretty small, 10%. I think uh, yeah. unmalted wheat is really as high as we've gone, and, and we like that. Um, we still want the vast majority of the malt flavor to be, the, you know, a continental European pills and base malt. Yeah, yeah. Um, talk to me a little bit about dry hopping uh, saisons. I know that's, uh, you know, having had some of your cans of these lately, you've gotten into a kind of uh, old school meets new school approach with uh, with pushing some small amounts of dry hops into your saisons, um, which, uh, again, kind of create a more modern approach to, you know, some of these kind of classic beers. Yeah, we had this, uh, we were just talking to other brewers and about dry hopping temperatures, and so we kind of had this idea, well, we ferment saisons, you know, 85 degrees, you can't do that with uh, a lot of these uh, IPA uh, yeasts. And so we thought, well, let's just do an experiment and start dry hopping saisons at really high temperatures with, uh, you know, different uh, new and old world hops and see what different flavors they create. And we did you know, like a Meridian one. We had a Meridian hop IPA at the same time. Almost zero flavor difference from the hop. Uh, we did Citra at 85 to 90 degrees dry hop and it threw off just these amazing white wine characteristics it was insane it was unlike uh you know citron any other beer and i just you know wish so hard we could you know ferment an ipa that high and of course you can with uh the norwegian strain but i don't particularly like that strain so we haven't done it but maybe you know we'll think about that more (laughs) That's that's really interesting to you know to look at the you know, different temperature impacts of dry hopping um, you know in that uh, ten or fifteen degrees can make such a big difference. Yeah, and I think it started. I think it was talking to uh, I don't know if it was bearded Irish guys, uh, somebody else. They're talking about their mosaic and playing with the different temperatures of mosaic in an IPA and where it threw off dankness and where it threw off blueberry and trying to trying to control that. So. Uh, What's next on uh, the realm of experimentation for uh, for Outer Range, and uh, what's uh, getting you excited to try next? You know, right now we're you know we're deep diving on quality, so yeah. <laughs> I'm excited about that. Um, but uh, I think we're gonna we're gonna start pushing more of these uh, herbal notes in in IPAs. We actually have uh, we're doing a, a beer with Adam Dooley, uh, head chef of uh, Brewers Association, for an outstanding in the field dinner. Uh, with Oscar Blues and Casey and we we're doing a lavender IPA and we just brewed that just brewed that last night um, so that's going to be with Hallertau Blanc which you know is 
a, a great kind of herbal, but still white wine, citrusy hop. Uh, so I think we're going to push a little bit more of those. Uh, we started uh, Mike from Microphone, got us brewing a bunch of stouts, so we've been rolling with that a little bit. We just brewed a, uh, on my birthday on Monday, we brewed a, uh, a stout um, that is a chocolate raspberry cake uh, based uh, stout with Jared uh, from Southern Grist here. So we're going to uh, keep rolling with those a little bit more too. I'm really enjoying those. Nice. Well, Lee, thanks for joining us on the podcast today. I know this is a tough week for you as you are uh, brewing nonstop to catch back up after a few days down and, uh, and cleaning and working through this whole process. Uh, we appreciate you taking a, an hour out of your day to come talk with me. Well, thanks so much, Jamie. Cool. Um, if uh, people want to learn more about Out of Range, where do they find you? We're in Frisco. First, come to the tap room. <laughs> we're a tap room focused brewery, but we're online. Uh, Instagram, yeah. Out of Range Brewing Co. And uh, you guys have thrown some great articles about us, so you can Google that too. Or just go to beerandbrewing.com and search for them. You don't need to Google for that kind of stuff. <laughs> so you just look at your subscription of craft beer and brewing that you have. There you go. There you go. Uh, yeah, you can search it on the uh, the digital app, which gives you access to all the back issues. Shameless plug. <laughs> uh, thanks to this episode's sponsors, uh, G&D Chiller is the brewing industry's premier choice for glycol chilling. Turn your fridge into the best craft beer bar around with the Tavor app. And Clarion Lubricants will work with you to create an efficient lubrication program. Uh, Lee Cleghorn, Outer Range Brewery, thanks for joining me on the podcast. Thanks, Jamie. Cheers. This podcast is brought to you by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. For those that love to make and drink great beer, learn more online or subscribe at beerandbrewing.com or find us on social media at craftbeerbrew.com.